Is it possible that we are being too cautious when correcting hyponatremia? And what truly is the risk of central pontine myelinolysis when correcting sodium? We were actually looking at a pretty interesting article actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The cohort included 3,274 patients, and there were three groups. There was a group of correction rate less than 6 milliequivalents per 24 hours, which was 38% of the cohort. 6 to 10 milliequivalents per 24 hours in 29% of the cohort, and greater than 10 milliequivalents per 24 hours in 33% of the cohort. Compared with the 6 to 10 milliequivalent uh, group, a correction rate of less than 6 milliequivalents per 24 hours exhibited higher in-hospital mortality in multivariable adjusted and propensity score-weighted analyses. A correction rate of greater than 10 milliequivalents per 24 hours was associated with lower in-hospital mortality and shorter length of stay in multivariable analyses. So already there's a ton of information here. So first of all, whenever I'm doing a journal club or a literature review, one of the good things to always take a look at is what type of study this is. And in this case, we would call this study a retrospective cohort study. And I always go to this UWorld temporality of different study designs uh, graphic to show what the different types of study designs there are. So obviously you've got like ran randomized control trials and prospective cohorts, and these are all higher quality of evidence, the higher up it is. Now, the lower you go, it becomes a little bit, you know, not as strong of evidence because you're really just looking at associations, which don't necessarily imply causation. But anyways, in this case, we're looking at a re retrospective cohort because we are reviewing the past records and looking at their risk factors. In this case, a correction rate of less than six, a correction rate of six to 10 or greater than 10, and then comparing the disease incidents. And in this case, their primary um, objectives that they were looking at, or the primary outcomes they were looking at were mortality, length of stay, and central pontine myelinolysis. So it's always important to define what your primary outcome is that you're measuring. So anyways, the conclusion from this paper was limiting the sodium correction rate was associated with higher mortality and longer length of stay. Whether the sodium correction rate influences neurologic complications needs further evaluation. So this is going to be a very interesting paper to look at because everywhere you go, you know, we have guidelines saying we should not correct faster than eight milliequivalents per hour, 24 hours because of the risk of central pontine myelinolysis. But then if you look at here, okay, first of all, out of 3,274 patients, only seven of the patients developed central pontine myelinolysis, and five of them developed it despite being under eight milliequivalents per 24 hours correction rate. In this study, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, out of 22,800 patients, um, 12 patients developed osmotic demyelination syndrome, 0.05%, uh, and uh, seven of these patients, or 58% of these patients, did not have rapid correction of sodium. This article here in the Society of Nephrology journal uh, looked at 1490 patients, another retrospective cohort study, and uh, basically eight patients out of these 1490 uh, developed uh, osmotic demyelination, uh, which is 0.5%. Five of these patients had apparent neurologic recovery. In their case, nearly all patients with osmotic demyelination had a documented episode of rapid correction. And I just want to show you one last study here um, done by the Mayo Clinic Journal. Um, there was 412 patients who had uh, severe hyponatremia, and there was only a single case of osmotic demyelination syndrome. So in terms of the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome, we can definitely say that the risk is fairly low, definitely less than 1%. Um, and, you know, one study even showing it was 0.05%. And... About half of the patients tend to see pretty good neurologic recovery, which is kind of different how I learned it. You know, we all learned about locked-in syndrome and how severe and debilitating that is. Um, but it seems like a lot of people actually do experience neurologic recovery. And then finally, number three is that the risk factors, again, include states of malnutrition, liver disease, electrolyte, electrolyte abnormalities, and such like that. All right, enough about that background. Let's actually look into the paper a little bit more to kind of determine whether we think this is high quality evidence or not. And just for your information here, they did put the 2013 US guidelines recommending a limit of less than eight milliequivalents per hour for patients at high risk and 10 to 12 uh, milliequivalents per liter per hour uh, for per 24 hours for patients at normal risk with chronic severe hyponatremia. And it's interesting actually to see this because a lot of times we just kind of do a blanket six to eight milliequivalent goal um, for all patients. But really, it should be 10 to 12 based on the guideline. 
It's just a lot of times we tend to be a little bit more cautious because everybody's worried about osmotic demyelination syndrome. So in terms of the methods, we conducted a retrospective cohort study of patients who presented with severe hyponatremia to Mass General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital between 1993 and December 2018. So this was the first point of uh, our journal club where we said, you know, this kind of, you know, the fact that it was such a long time frame and things were so different back then, you know, things were basically being charted on paper back then. Um, that kind of actually weakens the paper a little bit because sure, sometimes having more patients and more cases, it's oftentimes better. But in this case, it might not necessarily be better because some of that data from 1993 was extracted probably using paper charts. You know, they may have missed certain um, aspects of the patient's care, and it may have been more difficult to track uh, certain cases of osmotic demyelination syndrome or things like that. So sometimes actually having more data is not always better. Patients were included if they were at least 18 years of age with an index serum sodium level less than 120 in the 24 hours preceding or 24 hours after the recorded time of admission. Patients were excluded if they did not have any follow-up sodium value at admission or after 24 four hours of admission, if the index blood sample was hemolyzed, or if the glucose value was greater than 300 milligrams. So um, again, it's always important to look at their inclusion and exclusion criteria and figure out if you agree with how they designed the study and what uh, population they included and excluded. Again, we looked at the primary outcomes of interest, which were mortality rates in hospital and 30-day mortality, length of stay and incidence of uh, central pontine myelinolysis, which they tracked using a language uh, learning model that searched uh, MRIs for uh, the words of osmotic demyelination, pontine myelinolysis, edema, things like that. And then over here, they start talking about their statistical analyses here. So table one is going to be our baseline characteristics. Um, in the three groups, you can see there was about uh, 1,200 patients in the first group, 950 in the second group, and 1,000 in the last group. And you can see all of the different, um, you know, comorbidities that these patients had. One thing to note is that the... Um, group that corrected less than six milliequivalents per 24 hours tended to have more cirrhosis and heart failure compared to the group that did correct um, greater than 10 milliequivalents per 24 hours. So only 5% in this group and 25% here. And this may speak to um, the sense that there could be a difference in the patient populations. For example, the patients that uh, were in this less than six milliequivalent per 24 hour group may have had more predisposing factors for why they didn't respond as well to, um, you know, sodium correction or efforts to correct their sodium. And, you know, remember the outcome said that they had higher rates of mortality and higher rates of in hospital stay. Well, you know, looking at baseline, these patients seem to be sicker. There's more cirrhotic patients here. There's more patients with CHF here. And so that by itself can also explain why they had that finding of worsened outcomes in this less than six milliequivalent per 24 hour group. So in this case, it's actually very important to look at the baseline characteristics because this is a retrospective cohort study. It's not a randomized control trial. You know, when you take a look at a randomized control trial, typically, you want them to be proving uh, that the randomization uh, made both of the patient groups fairly equivalent. Um, and that's basically what table one shows you in RCTs. But in a retrospective cohort study, you're really just looking at, you know, what differences, you know, there's going to be potentially differences here between the groups. And in this case, we do see some of those differences. And so that's definitely something um, to keep in mind because these groups were not controlled, right? That, you know, they were not able to randomize patients into these groups. That's just another reason why these retrospective cohort studies are not as strong of a level of evidence as randomized control trials. Looking at their starting sodium, um, you know, in the three groups, it was fairly even, um, 117, 116, 114. Um, I did find their urine sodium and their urine osmolality interesting because if you look at, you know, that flow chart and you go through the hyponatremia algorithm, it's basically saying all these patients have SIADH. Um, but I, again, I don't think you can really trust the urine sodium for these, you know, patients because they may have received fluids in the ED beforehand or something like that. Plus, look at the standard deviation is, is like 54 plus or minus 43 or 48 plus or minus 40. So again, not super accurate. Average sodium correction was three in the first group, eight 
in the second group and 16 in the third group. And you can see here, so in the first group, in-hospital mortality was 13% compared to 8% in the second group and 5% in the third group. 30-day mortality was 21% here, 11% in the uh, second group and 8% in the third group. And the hospital length of stay was on average 10 days in the first two groups, while only eight days uh, in the last group. Looking at their statistical analyses, they calculated odds ratios to figure out um, how significant their findings were. And you can see that in the um, sodium correction, six to 10 was their reference group. And for this was for in-hospital mortality. If they corrected less than six um, mill equivalents per 24 hours, their risk of in-hospital mortality was 1.77 um, odds ratio compared to the reference group. Whereas the uh, group that corrected greater than 10 only had an odds ratio of 0.68 for in-hospital mortality. Finally, they included a more detailed table of the different patients who did experience uh, central pontine myelinolysis. And you can see they are, there were seven patients total. And if you look at uh, a lot of these patients, what was surprising to me is that most of these patients had good neurologic outcomes. So this patient had slow neurologic recovery over six to 12 months back to baseline at discharge. Um, you know, most of these patients uh, really had pretty good neurologic recovery, which is a little surprising to me. They took a look at their admission serum sodium, and you can see that it ranged from 103 up to 118. And then the correction rate here. So, <clears throat> you know, we had even some patients who only corrected by six, or this patient only corrected by three, somehow still developed central pontine myelinolysis. And then these patients corrected by 17 or 19. Um, but again, they actually had a full recovery afterwards, which is quite surprising. They looked at the etiology of the hyponatremia. So you can see hypovolemia, several cases of polydipsia and low solute intake. Uh, and then more episodes of hypovolemia. And so, again, if you look at their risk factors for developing CPM, almost all of these patients had some form of poor nutrition or electrolyte abnormalities. It's really interesting to read the rest of their discussion, too. You know, our study, similar to the recent study by McMillan, reports that CPM may develop despite limiting the sodium correction rate to less than or equal to 8 milliequivalents per liter per 24 hours. It has been hypothesized that in energy-deprived states, such as alcohol use or severe malnutrition, glycogen-depleted glial cells do not have sufficient reserve to maintain NAK ATPase activity, the primary mechanism of protection against cellular hydration when sodium is corrected, and hence they are particularly prone to osmotic stress and apoptosis. In the current study, six of seven patients with CPM had alcohol use disorder, malnutrition, hypokalemia, or hypophosphatemia. They talk about their strengths being that it was 25 years of practice at two large academic hospitals. And, uh, you know, the limitations being that, you know, it's a retrospective study again. One of the things I actually didn't mention earlier, but they conducted these subgroup analyses evaluating the relationship between correction rate and mortality uh, in patients with cancer, congestive heart failure, and cirrhosis. So they actually tried to correct for the fact that there were more patients with heart failure and cirrhosis in this uh, less than six mil equivalent per hour group. And based on that, they still did find the same findings that uh, faster correction rates were associated with uh, lower mortality and lower length of stay. And finally, in conclusion, they state, in practice, clinicians intentionally set the rates of sodium correction to less than 10 mil equivalents per liter per 24 hours or even lower. They are reluctant to use 3% hypertonic saline as it may lead to rapid correction, and they frequently apply sodium-lowering strategies when the rate of correction is exceeded. In fact, we observed a reduction in the average rate of correction in recent years, suggesting that the guidelines had an impact on reducing the correction rates. Our findings related to mortality, length of stay, and CPM prompt comprehensive assessment of the guidelines on clinical outcomes and stimulate the planning of prospective registries and clinical trials to examine the individual components of the current practice. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on this paper and if you think this will change your clinical practice at all, knowing that the central pontine myelinolysis risk is exceedingly low and doesn't actually really seem to be related to the rate of correction, but more about 
kind of these risk factors uh, for developing CPM instead. I mean, patients who corrected only by three or six milliequivalents per 24 hours develop central pontine myelinolysis. So maybe that practice that we have of only correcting people by six to eight milliequivalents per 24 hours Maybe that's kind of outdated and not really based on very solid evidence. Hope you enjoyed reading this article together. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.